Is originality important in a work of art? If one takes a look in an art history book, especially a book about art in the 20th century, one would certainly get the impression that what is valued in art are new ideas that have changed the existing paradigm. In 1863, the Salon des Refusés showed the works of modern artists that had been rejected by the very establishment Paris Salon. The International Exhibition of Modern Art, commonly known as the Armory Show of 1913, rocked the American art world with the introduction of the radical ideas of the European modern artists. Life magazine in 1949 proclaimed Jackson Pollock, dubbed Jack the Dripper by Time magazine a year later, as the greatest living American painter. In 1980, the art critic Robert Hughes presented a series about modern art produced by the BBC titled The Shock of the New. Our fickle 21st century attention spans seem to require fresh stimulation on an ever-frequent basis. But is it possible for an idea to be completely new? Is new the same as original? Must art be original for it to be legitimate? We're going to take a hard look at these questions. Often art is valuable for its uniqueness. As an object, the work of art is sometimes a unique production from an artist's hand and is therefore valuable as an artifact, investment, or historical relic. Does the artist have to make the work for it to be authentic? Many times artists use assistants and or outside manufacturers to realize the work. What part of the work is uniquely the artist in this case? The idea? Perhaps. Is Picasso, and in this case Bansky, correct when he says that great artists steal? If he steals someone's idea, isn't that plagiarism? Let's investigate this idea of appropriation in art. In this painting by Davi, he appropriates several elements. First, his style of painting became known as neoclassical because he revived the style of classical Rome and the Renaissance. He also appropriates the story of the death of Socrates as a metaphor for the ideals of the French Revolution. Surely the painting is from David's hand, the main parts at least. If there were assistants, their names did not live on through history. The style he did not invent, the story he did not invent. Is it the context in which he employs the story, the original idea? Here Manet doesn't exactly copy Titian's composition, but surely we would say that he is using it to make a point. In Titian's painting, Venus, a mythological figure, lies alluringly on her bed. But because she's not real, she's a goddess after all, Titian can get away with painting an erotic figure in overwhelmingly Catholic Italy in 1538. But in 19th century France, Manet appropriates the artistically acceptable composition of Titian, but substitutes a young French prostitute for the goddess in his painting. Is this in-your-face snub at Victorian morality the originality behind this painting? So in our brief look at these two paintings, ones considered to be masterpieces of Western art, we've already called into question this idea of originality. When modernism came along in the 20th century, what was considered art changed dramatically. Modern art was part of the revolution, out with the old ways and in with the new. Is contemporary art any more original than the old masters? In the rest of this video, we'll look at some important modern and contemporary artists and see if and where the originality exists in their work. These are our first four. Georges Braque and Picasso shared a studio in Paris. They were both experimenting with pushing the boundaries of art. Around 1912 or so, Brock brought home a roll of fa oak green wallpaper and began including it in his drawings. Picasso quickly jumped on the idea, remember he'll steal anything, and began to include collage in his work as well. What came to be known as synthetic cubism called into question the way we experience the world. These early appropriations of real world objects for use in painting were some of the first, dare I say original, times where the artist did not create all the images included in the work of art. By the time Europe had been devastated by World War I, artists with a revolutionary bent began to see art not just as a way to describe their experience of the world, but also as a mechanism that would allow us to return to that natural state of Rousseau's noble savage by accessing the part of the mind that had not been corrupted by society namely our subconscious. Max Ernst and Hannah Hock, a 
appropriated the images from magazines and prints to create irrational tableaus that would challenge our sense of the rational world and what the function of art was in a decaying world. Even though Picasso, Brock, Ernst, and Hawk challenged the notion of art and what art was for, their use of appropriated images remained primarily pictorial. That is, even though they were questioning the reality of perception, they still emphasized the visual experience of an artwork. Our next group of artists, and especially our old friend Marcel Duchamp, used the appropriated objects in their work to ends that were less concerned with the pictorial elements in the art object, which began to question the very nature of art itself. When Duchamp entered his fountain in an art show in 1917, it caused an uproar. Not so much because the use of a urinal was crass, although that bit of humor was probably not lost on Duchamp, but because Duchamp had not done anything but choose the object. Duchamp's point was, of course, that art exists in the mind and not in the object, but the notion of the preciousness of the handmade object was now called into question. Was the uniqueness of the object now needed for art to exist? Duchamp had a whole group of objects he called ready-mades. Because they lacked many of the qualities like artistic skill and composition that had been accepted aspects of art throughout history, they changed the way we interacted with the artwork and made the experience primarily conceptual rather than visual. Duchamp had read a newspaper story about a man who had broken his arm shoveling heavy snow. This work is titled, In Advance of a Broken Arm. It calls into question the ideas of time, utility, all sorts of things. He placed a snow shovel against the wall of a gallery. Unfortunately, the custodian of the gallery kept moving his shovel back to the gardening shed, thinking it was just a tool. Duchamp had to explain to the custodian that it was in fact his artwork. Appropriating this object and changing the context clearly was not enough to make everyone question their notions of reality. A little later, at the end of the 1950s, and after a period where a style of painting known as Abstract Expressionism was prominent in the New York art scene, two guys, Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, began to appropriate objects for use in their art. Partly in reaction to what they saw as a morbidly over-serious and self-aggrandized approach to art making by the Ab Xers, Rauschenberg and Johns used common objects in their work. Rauschenberg said, I think a painting is more like the real world if it's made out of the real world. He literally used his bed, things he found on the street and at flea markets, to make his artworks. These artworks came to be known as combines because they weren't really paintings and they weren't really sculpture. Jasper John stated that he was just trying to find a way to make pictures, and it was not the artist's job to worry about what the paintings implied about the world. He liked things that were already made. However, the work of both Rauschenberg and Johns brought art back from the visually abstract art that had dominated the Western art world in the early and mid 20th century. Their appropriated objects became new objects that existed in the world. New, yes, but original? Ah, oh, there's that nasty question again. Joseph Cornell was a visual poet. He made small, intimate boxes where he combined found objects to create poetic tableaus. Cornell lived with his mother and his disabled brother his whole life in a small house in Flushing, New York. While his work is very much a visual experience, he uses found objects that he then assembles. He makes nothing except the overall arrangement. But perhaps more interesting than the work that Cornell is most known for was his early experiments with film. Cornell made films by taking old footage he found at junk shops and reassembling the film strips into new arrangements. In 1936, he showed a film that he made by slicing together parts of found film footage, mostly from a film called East of Bornea that featured a young starlet named Rose Hobart, with whom Cornell was obsessed. When he screened the film at the Julian Lever Gallery, Salvador Dali was in the audience and became enraged because he said he had the idea to make a film like that and was just about to, and that Cornell somehow stole the idea from his subconscious. The shy Cornell was so intimidated by Dali that he rarely showed his films again. An original approach to filmmaking using someone else's film? Is that possible? <laughs> Rauschenberg and Johns had brought some humor back into art with their combines and other work. America was now in the throes of a post-World War II economic boom. TV and movies were now a part of everyday life, and achieving the good life was every American's dream. Well, white Americans anyway. Minorities were still just trying to get their equal rights. 
The artist that came to be known as the pop artist embraced this boom of images from advertising and popular culture. They wanted to break down the boundaries between high art and low art. Andy Warhol was the master appropriator. He took photographs in newspapers and magazines of celebrities, electric chairs, car crashes, anything he saw Americans obsessing about. He often didn't even touch his own work, having assistants carry out his instructions and using a photo silkscreen technique that didn't show the artist's hand. The image of Marilyn Monroe was perfect Warhol image. She was the embodiment of celebrity. She was the embodiment of beauty. She was famous and she died a tragic death. So he didn't take the photo. He didn't touch his own work. Is there originality here? Roy Lichtenstein is another artist who claims his work makes no statement about the world. He appropriated images from the funny pages and comics in his early work, and then took a style to art history. He tried to make his paintings look as if they were made by a machine. Robert Colescott is the first artist of color we encountered so far. For those of you keeping count, we've only seen one woman. Unfortunately, sexism and racism was, and still is, a problem in the art world. We've only seen Western artists here. Where's the rest of the world? We'll get to some Chinese artists later. But that's no excuse for me to give you the impression that Western art is the only important art. It's not. But given the geopolitical state of affairs in the developed world of the 20th century, that's where most of popular art movements in recent history come from. With the development of other countries and access to art to the internet, more and more non-Western art is coming to be seen as vital and important. Cole Scott uses an irreverent approach to art history, but he makes some deadly important points with his work about racism and sexism in America. Cole Scott recontextualizes the images and the paintings he appropriates, and they become carriers of new meaning. Picasso's de Mademoiselle de Avignon is seen as one of the earliest modern paintings. Think about what that means for a second. Who's modern? Who gets to participate in the benefits of a modern world? Willem de Kooning's Woman One is seen as one of the most important paintings by an American painter. What is Cole Scott saying? Look carefully at what you see in this iconic American painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. Was something missing before? We're leaving the 1960s and moving into the 70s. Minimalist sculpture was all the rage. And many artists were following Duchamp's lead and in investigating the conceptual limits of art. Video cameras and editing equipment had become accessible to the general public. And now more and more artists incorporated that technology into their work. John Baldessari is important for a couple of reasons. One, he used appropriated images in a very conceptual way to address issues of art theory, image, and language. The other is because he was an important teacher at a number of schools in California and influenced a whole generation of artists who came to fame in the 80s, which we'll see in a minute. He often juxtaposed appropriated imagery and text. Language and its meaning played a big part in his work. Bruce Conner made his name as an assemblage artist in the late 50s and 60s but gave that up and began experimenting with film and video. He used a lot of appropriated footage and montage to create his visual images. He saw his work as art and not traditional film. His editing techniques influenced many video and film artists, especially those who made music videos in the early years of MTV. One of his first movies, titled A Movie, uses a non-narrative montage to question the notion of what film could be. Tara Birnbaum was one of the early artists to address specifically feminist themes in her work. Primarily a video and installation artist, her work addressed the images and gender issues portrayed in the mass media of the 1970s. So we've seen the development of the use of the appropriated image move from the pictorial to the conceptual. We're still trying to find the originality, and in some cases it's easier to see than others. However, these next artists, who came to prominence in the 80s, are so extreme in their use of appropriation that they force us to question the very question we are asking. Interestingly, three of these artists are women. Some critics have called Cindy Sherman the most important artist of the 21st century. In her early work, she painstakingly remade compositions from film stills, replacing the subject with herself. As her work evolved, she began to branch out from this idea but her work is still involved with exploring the notions of identity, postmodern life, and societal role. 
Sherry Levine is one of the most controversial artists from this period. Her work is literally copies of other artists' work. She began by photographing other artists' photographs from books. She did not alter the photos at all, but presented the new photos as her own work. She continued to appropriate the work of other artists and made paintings of other artists' paintings, photographs of paintings, or photographs of black and white photographs in color. The belief is that there is no such thing as originality. The object provides pleasure or not. By re-photographing or reproducing the work of others, she begs the question of what is the experience of a work of art. Vicki Alexander uses photographs from fashion magazines and films. She changes the meaning of the original photos by juxtaposing them in new contexts. Mike Bidlow takes the style and composition of recognizable artworks and makes them in his own hand. While we recognize these images, they are not quite right. Are they fakes or original Mike Bidlow's? These are two famous self-portraits, one by Picasso on the left and one by Matisse. The whole notion of reproducing a self-portrait raises some interesting questions about the nature of identity and reproduction. In 1953, Robert Rauschenberg went to Willem de Kooning's studio with a bottle of whiskey. De Kooning was the preeminent American abstract expressionist painter. Rauschenberg wanted to convince de Kooning to give him a drawing that he could erase. This is perhaps the ultimate act of appropriation, literally erasing the drawing of another artist and a resulting work as your own. De Kooning said yes, but made it hard on Rauschenberg by giving him a drawing that was very hard to erase. Think about the implications of this. Erasing a valuable drawing by one of America's most important artists that is part of the body of work that helped make Rauschenberg one of America's most important artists. Bidlow extends this problem. He makes an imitation de Kooning drawing and then erases that drawing to make an imitation Rauschenberg. It's titled Not Rauschenberg Erased de Kooning Drawing. Are you getting a headache yet? So we've only been in the canon of Western art history so far. This is important only because much of the development of art had to do with the art markets and schools that proliferated in developed countries in the early 20th century. But now we're in China's century, as some would call it, so of course some Chinese artists are joining and expanding the canon of contemporary art, and some of them use appropriation as well. These Chinese artists use the imagery from the Cultural Revolution, popular Chinese kitsch, and advertising images from the West to make what has been called political pop or cynical realism. By juxtaposing these images, they create new contexts, which comment on the tension of a communist country that is developing along the lines of the free market West. Shortly after Sheng Chi graduated from art school, he cut off his little finger in protest at the Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989 and buried it in a porcelain flower pot. He exiled himself to France, but his finger remained in China. He returned to China in 1999 and became one of China's most important contemporary artists. Here he has appropriated the image of Delacroix's famous 19th century painting, Liberty Leading the People, and put it in a Chinese context. Three brothers collaborate to make art under the name Le Brothers. They juxtapose traditional Chinese imagery with modern kitsch and the ads of Western companies affecting traditional Chinese culture. This painting by Yu Yao Han is an interesting appropriation of two Warhol appropriations. Chairman Mao and Marilyn Monroe are two iconic Warhol images from the 60s. Yu merges the image for a strange hybrid that makes an interesting statement about contemporary China. Wang Guangyi contrasts the communist propaganda images from the Mao era with ultra-capitalist logos. Interestingly, you can find many counterfeit Guangyi paintings in Beijing. So now that we've visited this idea of originality with a little history, we might be persuaded that Picasso was right. Great artists do steal with impunity. Appropriation is still a slippery slope for artists. Some artists, like Andy Warhol, Richard Prince, Jeff Koons, and Damien Hirst have faced lawsuits from companies and other artists for copyright infringement. These lawsuits have raised interesting questions for artists and their use of appropriated images. But clearly appropriation has had a long history in art. Perhaps there is nothing new under the sun.